Ma'am, can we begin? Sushma, ma'am. Shall we begin? Yes, yes. Can you see me? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. So do you want me to start now? Uh, no, ma'am. I'll just give a short introduction and then we can okay, start. Okay, sure, sure. Good morning. On behalf of the Department of English, Etheridge College for Women, I extend my cordial welcome to all of you to the fifth day of the five-day national webinar series on post-colonial literatures, contexts, and concerns. The past four days, we've been the recipients of valuable insights and thought-provoking lectures from eminent scholars and academicians from various parts of the world, so, to the, of the country. To add to the bouquet of such eminence, we have with us today Dr. Shishma V. Murthy, Associate Professor, Department of English, Christ Deemed to be University, who will be sharing her views with us on the topic, Interlocking Schemes of Resistance and Sisterhood, Intersectional Approaches to Southeast Asian Feminist Literatures. An erudite scholar, she's a passionate teacher of gender studies, post-colonial and world literatures, cultural studies, and British literature. She was affiliated to the University of Montreal under the Shastri Doctoral Research Fellowship in 2007-08 and secured a doctoral degree in 2014 for her dissertation, The Burnished Phoenix, Lesbian Aesthetics in the Works of Nicole Brazot from the University of Mysore. Her research interests include cure theory and literature, feminist translation studies, psychoanalytical feminism, and trauma narratives by women. Her publications include research articles on feminist translation, uh, transgender aesthetics, and cure theory. Currently, Dr. Murthy is completing a major research project on select popular fiction of Triveni, a prominent psychoanalytical feminist writer in Canada. The project examines psychocultural aspects of women's mental health, health disorders with heightened focus on the gendered narrativization of trauma in cases of hysteria. Thank you very much, ma'am, for graciously accepting our invitation to be the speaker for the day and share your expertise with us. Over to you, ma'am. Okay. Good morning. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you to all the members of uh, the Department of English at Tiraj College for this opportunity, especially to Dr. Yashoda for uh, you know reaching out to me and extending this very interesting space uh, to discuss some of my research on South Asian and especially Southeast Asian feminist writers. So what I will do now is I will start sharing the screen. Please tell me. Uh, I will have to tell you a few things before. Um, my laptop uh, has a few issues since last evening. So I may not be able to look into the chat box. If you have any questions, I will take it later. Uh, and when, while I'm presenting, I might find it difficult to come back to the uh, you know, main screen. I hope uh, you will bear with me. OK, so I think for the next uh, 45 minutes, we will talk about uh, uh, Southeast Asian feminist writing. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen now. Please tell me if it is visible and if uh, it looks all right. Is it visible now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah. So I will make it full screen mode. Um, Okay. Uh, can you put it in slideshow mode maybe yeah that's what i'm trying to do from current uh, slide yes let me start are you able to see it now in full screen yes full screen yes. ma'am is it full screen now i have made it full not screen yet, here. Ma not yet not yet no ma'am not oh. yet okay mm -hmm. uh, it is full screen for me i don't know what's happening ma'am uh, like uh, in the taskbar you have slideshow ma'am uh, yes, that's what that's what that? yeah, that's what I have done actually. Just a minute, please. Ma'am, once from slide like you uh, slide, uh, slideshow and then from current slide. Okay, just give me a minute, please. Yeah, I'll go do it from current slide. Maybe let me try that now. Yes, ma'am. Now uh, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. Not yet. Okay. Is it okay if I just go on? Because 
ിസം <laughs> Uh, southeast asian feminist writing as critics as writers as readers it's possible for us to build up a dialogic consciousness and this is possible because of the intersectionality of our concerns so i will introduce you briefly to both dialogic consciousness and intersectionality and uh, i will pitch this against a dominant western feminist trope that we have had in reading uh, you know southeast asian uh, you know feminist writers uh so our understanding of feminism itself comes from uh, a binary it comes from the understanding of sexual difference as well as gender differentiation and it is the basis of almost all feminism no doubt about it but when we look at feminism in southeast uh, you know asia uh, when we look at feminism uh, interlocking with multiple you know layers of identity when we look at the politics for of uh, religion or caste for example in india in in relation to women uh it is very you know difficult for us to uh, very sit very sit very easily within this binary right um and to be able to look at uh, feminism merely as the empirical route to emancipation or empowerment of women right is you know it's it's only maybe half of the job right so what is very important for us to understand that concerns of gender right in southeast uh, you know asian countries are also concerns of you know caste of race of religion of the intersections of uh, you know the multi layered identities that we all inhabit so our societies are complex our cultures are a lot more complex than the you know the uh, you know the white feminist ideologies that we have been introduced to so if you look at the uh, academic orientation that we give to most of our students and uh, the way in which we introduce students to feminism it is largely placed within this binary right um, and i and that binary will not work for a context which is very different which is very non western which is extremely intersectional and that is what i am trying to do in this presentation you know trying to have a dialogue with you on the various ways in which we can address the specificities of you know oppression rather than looking at feminism as a fight against men or rather than looking at feminism merely as an empirical route to equality right uh so our questions of feminism are not so much questions of equity and equality as they are larger questions of nation nationalism uh you know inclusivity a uh, diversity heterogeneity and the possibility of living in a multicultural space right so uh, that is my uh, larger premise and i will begin from here okay uh now i find uh, some of these uh, observations very very pertinent uh you know when we are taking a lens to south asian feminisms largely specifically southeast asian feminisms so uh, i would say my my most favorite uh, quotation would come from ahashweta devi right because she grounds us she gives us this very uh, you know foundational idea of touching base of never leaving the grassroots when we look at women in south asia especially southeast asia i have always believed that the real history is made by ordinary people the reason and inspiration for my writing are those people who are exploited and used and yet do not accept defeat sometimes it seems to me that my writing is really their doing so with mahashweta devi you have um, you know an understanding that unless you look at the realities of the uh, questions of the men right within the larger questions of nationalism or citizenship or race or you know in today's context transnationalism so as uh, arjun App appadurai says there are a lot of uh, you know global cultural flows that we are part of today 
thanks to media, thanks to technology, thanks to the capitalist frameworks in which we all inhabit. So thanks to globalization, there is a perception that perhaps, like Friedman said, uh, that the world is flat, right? Um, and somehow we like to think, think of the world right through the lens of, uh, look at the world through the lens of globalization. And it looks like all our, you know, existence are wrapped around this capitalist, consumerist, globalized space of being. And that is simply not true because that is a largely Western uh, approach to the idea of globalization. So what is the impact of uh, capitalism on state app apparatuses? What is the impact of capitalism on uh, the way in which we perceive uh, what we call as the first world as against the third world? Well, so what is the what is the perception of the first world when it comes to the third world, right? And how much of third world feminism gains, uh, you know, uh, representation when we talk about feminism at all? Um, and what are the concerns that we are, you know, uh, you know, uh, what is it that we are concerned with, right? So when we look at Afghanistan, for example, are we concerned about uh, women's actual conditions, or are we going to take a very paternalistic attitude like the West? Right, and talk only about, say, uh, the burqa or the hijab. These, these are very important questions that we need to ask. So, you know, what, what are the basis uh, for us to come back to the local? What are the foundations of, you know, feminism at the grassroots level? And I think Mahashweta Devi becomes very, very important, and her writing, you know, grounds us in the uh, historical, right? The historical basis of a post-colonial nation, right, where inequalities of caste, where, uh, you know. Uh, to a large extent during the Naxalite movement, the criminalization of tribes and also the idea of, uh, you know, uh, citizenship based on a certain politics of inclusivity and exclusivity has been in operation, right? Excuse so, me, yes? Ma'am, the slides aren't changing. Uh, the slides are not changing because I'm still talking about Mahashwet. Okay, okay, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you will see that whatever I have put on the slides are very representational. And I will be elaborating on them. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma thank so, you. So the idea that uh, gender is something very complex, right? The complexity of gender requires an interdisciplinary and post-disciplinary set of discourses in order to resist the domestication of gender studies and women's studies within the ac academy. This is very important, right? Uh, so how much of our uh, feminism is defined by the disciplinary boundaries of academia? How much of our, uh, you know, feminism is bound by uh, theoretical frameworks which we import from the West? How much of our feminism is grounded in the academy? And how much of our feminism is domesticated, right? And it's important for us to resist this. And it's important for us, like Judith Butler says, to look at a very post-disciplinary, not, not just interdisciplinary, but post-disciplinary set of discourses in order to resist the domestication of gender studies and women's studies within the academy. So, you know, the, the idea of South Asian, Southeast Asian feminisms, right, comes from a long history of resistance to feminist epistemology, right, which means that when we look at women's oppression or when we look at feminism in Southeast Asia, we are not looking at the mainstream Western academic framework of feminism, but we are looking at the actual historical conditions for the oppression of women, including caste, race, religion, right, in, in you know, indigeneity, ethnicity, right. Uh, I mean, and not to, you know, uh, forget the impact of media, right, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, idea of violence, right, that is meted out mostly through the media, right, and what we are foregrounding here is women's ontological reality. So the, the lens that we are taking to Southeast Asian feminism is not epistemological, rather it is ontological, because whatever is ontological is based on experiential lived realities, right. So, uh, the idea that I'm going to look at a few writers, few representational writers from different parts of Southeast Asia who have looked at women through this lens, through the lens of lived realities, actual social conditions, and the historical basis of oppression that comes, you know, over a long period of time. And the resistances that we, you know, we have put up to these different forms of oppression is what I um, not because it is Western, but because it is something that uh, looks at the marginalized, the minoritarian, which is very important for us to look at, is the concept of genealogy that Foucault talked about, right? So Foucault talks about the archaeology of knowledge, 
right? Uh, which is the basis for history or how history is created with a capital H, right? And how at that, at the cost of that history, right, uh, being created, there are a lot of genealogies that are left out. So genealogies are uh, basically complex, mundane, inglorious origins, right? Um, you know, origins of narratives, of people, of histories, which have no way of, you know, finding a place in the grand scheme of progressive history, right? Uh, so if you look at uh, Dalit history, right, if you are able to look at India through Dalit history, is it possible to do so without looking at Dalit literature? And that is what Dalit literature is doing. If you look at um, most histories are patriarchal histories, they are patriarchal narratives. And that's the reason why, why they are called histories. And it's important for us, therefore, to recognize that literature becomes a very important space for historicity as well as historiography. Now, historicity is the very, very specific politics of location that each one of us has within the larger history. So as a woman living in India, as a woman living in Bangalore, right, I have multiple histories. So I have the history of Bangalore, of belonging to Bangalore as a woman. I have the history of uh, being a Kanadiga. I have the history of you know, uh, belonging to a space that is very cosmopolitan, thanks to the education that I've had, right? Uh, I also have my own personal history of being a woman belonging to a particular caste or a particular community. So you will realize that although, you know, what is given to you as history is largely based on the building up of empires, you will see that historicity is that space where you can be subjective and experiential, right? Um, and most of the time, women's histories are based on historicities rather than the grand narrative of colonial history, right? And when we write, when women write, or when women speak, or when women articulate their experiences within the larger politics of their historicity or multiple historicities, what women are doing is what we call as historiography. So historiography is the critical reading and writing of history. And it's possible for literature to be historiography. It's possible for folklore to be historiography. It's possible for you know graffiti on the wall to be part of historiography. It's possible for a graphic novel to be historiography. So historiography consists of these multiple uh, narratives that have come outside of the grand colonial narrative of history. And this is where I would like to situate Southeast Asian feminist writing as historiography, because it comes from a very subjective and experiential space of historicity. OK, yeah. So the next cons two concepts that I would like to introduce you to before I go to the actual text that I want to discuss from Southeast uh, feminist writers, Southeast Asian feminist writers is number one, dialogic consciousness. And the other one is intersectionality. Right. So uh, for those of you who are not aware of these concepts, the term dialogic actually comes from Bakhtin, Mikhail Bakhtin. Right. And uh, it comes from his idea of the dialogic principle. Right. Uh, so when we look at uh, di dialogue as a space of uh, exchange, as a space of sensitization, as a space of awareness, as a space of sisterhood. And that is what a lot of um, our narratives are doing. Right. Because when a Muslim woman writes from Pakistan, say when Intia Zarka writes from Pakistan, she is resonating with Muslim women across the world. Right. Uh, belonging to multiple specificities of culture, of nationalism, of race, of, you know, the practice of religion, right? And we know that uh, Imtiaz Darkar's Parda is something that we can read across both traditional uh, contexts of Islamic religion as well as modern contexts of transnationalism. And that is what I mean by feminism as a dialogue in literature, right? So literature creates this dialogue. Literature creates this, these bridges. The literature creates this consciousness of belonging to a community of women, uh, at the, while at the same time respecting our individual unique experiences as women, which are divergent, which are different from one another. Right. So feminism needs to open up dialogue with the intersectional aspects of oppression to fully comprehend women's concerns. So what does that mean? When I'm saying intersectional, Right. I mean that gender cannot be isolated from caste, class, race, ethnicity and other social markers. Right. So um, I cannot talk about, uh, say, a woman in Malaysia without talking about the politics of nationalism, without the politics of uh, perhaps even tourism and how that affects the global uh, identity of Malaysia, because Malaysia does have a global identity. If I'm talking about women, say, from uh, Pakistan, 
it's important for us to acknowledge the post-colonial basis of women's experiences. And therefore, you see, when I'm looking at women's oppression, as Chandra Talpade Mohanty says, we cannot all look at, uh, you know, third world women through the same lens. And that is what she's talking about, right? Under Western lens, we all become one body of third world women. Or the third world woman becomes this very essentialist, uh, you know, reductive, uh, you know, uh, marker for all women, right? And that is something that we cannot risk at this point of time because uh, having had a long history of post-colonial writing, having been aware of the specificity of our, you know, oppression as women, right? Now it's time to create these dialogues, right? So, um, and what is it that helps us to create these dialogues? It is because perhaps my experience as an Indian woman is bound up with my caste more than perhaps race. Whereas, uh, say, a woman from another part of Southeast Asia, right, uh, might have to deal with the politics of transnationalism because uh, she belongs to a more global space. For example, Singapore, right, which is a consumerist capitalist space of tourism, of technology, right. Uh, in fact, we really don't hear much about Singapore other than what happens with its tourism, what happens with its industries, what happens with its deliberations and context in relation to the first world, you know, out there. Right. And on, on the same hand, when we, you know, hear about other nations, uh, you know, say, for example, Bangladesh right, or Sri Lanka, we are so much caught up in the ethnic conflicts of those regions that we really do not look at them as, uh, you know, uh, through other lenses. For example, you don't take the global lens uh, to, you know, Sri Lanka, right, because you, you look at Sri Lanka as, you know, um, as a developing country or we're still an underdeveloped country. So, you know, we have these very rigid stereotypes about different parts of the world and women belonging to different parts of the world, right? Um, and we take these lenses to these spaces, right? Um, so it's very important for us to realize that our identities are not just based on our genders, but it's rather, you know, uh, controlled and, uh, you know, manipulated by other schemes of intersectionality, right? So uh, the politics of race becomes very important, for example, for women who are living abroad, who are immigrants in another community. Uh, this may not be very important for Indian women writers, for example, right? So um, how do you look at diasporic Muslim women, say, as against women living in India, right? Uh, or how do you look at the politics of Bangladeshi women living in the UK, right? So their idea of the experience of gender itself or womanhood itself it's tied up not with nationhood, but with the politics of transnationalism, which denies them their national identity. And, you know, post 9-11, you will see that even your religious identity becomes highly problematic in the Western space. If you are an immigrant, right, the hijab becomes extremely problematic, right, to the dominant discourses of nationalism out there in whichever white nation you are embodied, right? While at the same time, your domestic space requires you to look at the uh, idea of culture, right? So you're not only carriers of culture, but you're also keepers of your culture if you're women. Because the, the, the burden of right, preserving the culture of one's nation right, or the roots um, or to be able to you know, define the home as a, a private space of one's cultural identity in a foreign country largely falls upon the women's shoulders. Right. So the idea of intersectionality basically comes from Kimberly Crenshaw, who is, uh, you know, an advocate and feminist activist. Right. Um, and, you know, she came up uh, with the uh, the term, of course, has been used extensively by a lot of Afro-American writers, including Bell Hooks. Right. But Kimberly Crenshaw was the activist who made it popular. Right. Because the idea of race as something that is being not only integral, but almost inseparable from, you know, uh, black women and their gender is something that uh, was become was very problematic for her when she took up this case of a woman who was working in a garment factory who wanted some you know uh, she wanted a legal re redress right um, and uh, she was talking about how she was doubly marginalized because of her race as well as her you know gender and it became very difficult for her. Uh, for Kim Kimberly Crenshaw, who took, uh, who represented this woman, Afro American woman, to you know defend her case and to kind of you know uh, situate the politics of oppression either as gender or as race, and obviously you know the case was not successful, right? She lost the case because of this uh, you know politics of not being able to differentiate 
or, or not so not being so easily able to um, you know take apart gender and race because they are so completely integrated into the identity of the afro-american woman right um and we realized that it's because of intersectionality we realized that oppression and privilege can coexist what that means is i may be privileged because i'm upper class i might be earning well i might be educated i might be working in a well-known university for example but on the basis of my gender i can be oppressed or i might be upper caste and privileged but being a woman within my caste might you know mean that i'm also oppressed so it's possible for women to be at the same time you know uh, recipients of privilege as well as oppression right and uh, it is this lens that allows us to look at the complexity of women's issues right because when you are looking at a woman's uh, you know identity you are not just looking at you know her gender you are looking at a lot of other aspects that embody her gender which condition her gender or which represent her gender right so if i'm for example a brahmin woman in india right that might be seen as an identity of privilege but within my own community the patriarchal you know uh, what do you say ideologies that govern my role as a woman within my family within my community right might be extremely oppressive right so it, it's interesting therefore for us to realize that intersectionality allows us to look at you know the heterogeneity of women's experiences the intersectionality of the uh, you know, women's experiences and it's important for us to do this because we cannot take the binary approach to feminism when it comes to women who belong to specific socio cultural contexts and specific post colonial concerns of nationalism and transnationalism we cannot take the old root of feminism as okay women against men or women you know for labor for property right marriage civil rights right so uh, women's empowerment women's uh, emancipation or women's uh, equity all of these become very important empirical tools for uh, liberating women to a large extent but in 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 uh, context such as southeast asia it's important for us to look at the intersectionality of these concerns because that is where the oppression comes from right so uh, any kind of tokenism any kind of supposed uh, you know uh, glossed over realities of emancipation that come from either employment or education is not an easy approach to the women in southeast asia right so um are the slides moving for you not so far ma'am it's just the first opening slide oh really oh yes. i'm so sorry Okay. The slides have stopped moving for me as well. Just give me a minute. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I think I'll just continue. Okay. I'm extremely sorry for the technical uh, problems that I'm facing. Some problem with my laptop. May I continue, please? Hello. Uh, yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right. But the slides yeah. are still uh, not moving. Yeah, it's not moving for me also. <laughs> it's even the escape button is not working. No, no. So, no, maybe after the presentation, okay. you can share the slides with us. Yes, definitely. Then, yeah. Is the is it moving now for you? Uh, no, ma'am, it's not. Okay, now. Yes, yes. Okay, I will. I will. Uh, I have exited the full screen mode, so I think this is better for both of us, right? Uh, yes, ma'am. So it's visible talk, and it's moving now. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Right. Uh, so if you look at the uh, the critical work that has gone into Southeast Asian feminisms, you know, I mean, feminist critics who have looked at feminist uh, literatures from Southeast Asia, uh, largely from South Asia here, right? Um, Ranu Nial and uh, Cecile Santon they have made this very important observation. Uh, they say South Asian women have been writing from within a uh, predominantly male literary tradition right and we continue to look at them for instance as you know women writers looking from a I mean writing from a largely male literary tradition right um, so if you look at the discourse of uh, indian for example no, indian sorry, sorry are you able to hear me uh, i'm very sorry to interrupt you ma'am yeah you're you're audible ma'am but your slides have i think 
jumped from first to uh, fourth or fifth. We have missed some slides in between. Now. Okay, are you, you looking just... at uh, are you looking at paths traversed? Is that the first? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the correct okay. slide. Absolutely, that's the correct slide. Yes, yeah. Okay. So, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. So, uh, if you look at the role of uh, you know Indian writing in English or Indian diasporic writing, or what we see as Indian writing at all, right? Um, you will see that there is a strong uh, you know, state apparatus of nationalism at work, because we tend to look at these as national literatures, right? Or we look at the, look at, tend to look at these as literatures from India, and what is the India that we are talking about, right? This is largely a post-colonial nation that we you know, are looking at. And we know how that nation is founded and how that nation continues to be founded, right? Uh, for instance, you will not look at, uh, you know, uh, literatures from India or Pakistan or Bangladesh, right, um, as a heterogeneous form of literature or as a plural, you know, um, palimpsest, right? You would rather look at it as, okay, literature coming from India, right? And it's very important for us to recognize that uh, when we write, they are responding to this canonicity of the tradition of nationalism and literature, right? Uh, not only are they questioning nation and nationalism, this is not to say that they are exempting themselves from the nation, but they are looking at the whole process of how a nation gets constructed through literature and to a large extent when they speak from their own you know, points of view, that is what they are doing. For example, if you look at partition uh, literature right, uh, from women in India, Right. You will see that their writing is very different from those written by men. Right. So, for example, women talk about the fact that, uh, you know, uh, some very domestic things like how they left something burning on the hearth or cooking on the hearth and it probably got burnt out and they were driven out of their homes. Right. Uh, so the violence that were that was inflicted on their bodies. Right. Or perhaps the idea of memory. Right. And how it's possible to reconstruct history through memory, through emotion, through feeling. Right. Uh, and these become very central to women's writing, uh, which is to a large extent, I would say, experiential, which is to a large extent intimate. Right. Um, intimate not only to their bodies, but intimate to very different acts of, you know, knowing something because knowledge need not necessarily be epistemological. Feeling can be a knowledge. Memory can be a knowledge. Emotion can be a knowledge. So the, your sensory perception through your bodies could be your knowledge. Right. Um, and this becomes very, very important for us because when you look at feminism, right, uh, feminism needs to address femininity, right? I'm not saying that there is this one idea or entity or embodiment called femininity which we all of us inhabit. No, we do not, right? The whole point here is that the individual, the, the very basis of what becomes feminine or how a, a person becomes feminine, right, is something that we need to look at. Right. And we realize when we look at women's writing from Southeast Asia that femininity is contingent and it cannot be isolated from culture. And this is very important. Right. Uh, so what are the questions of femininity, therefore? So if you are questioning the notion of femininity, then you are questioning the larger hegemonies of the state, hegemonies of religion, caste, race and ethnicity. Not to not to forget the question of the nation, right, to which we all are supposedly, you know, uh, belonging. I'm using belonging very consciously there as a continuous process of belonging to a particular nation through citizenship, right? So, uh, so the idea of the binaries which bind us today, right? So, for example, the fact that the the idea of womanhood, vis-a-vis uh, -vis one's caste, one's race, one's class, one's ethnicity, one's nationalism and citizenship continues to be a traditional relationship to a large extent. Whereas we inhabit cultures which have become heterodox, right? Um, so I do not know which is better and which is worse, or which is worser than the other, right? Uh, is it orthodoxy or is it heterodoxy? So for example, uh, Imtiaz Darkar talks about, uh, in Parda 2, she talks about immigrant Muslim women coming from different parts of the world and living in the UK, right? Um, and she talks about how, although they wear Western clothes, Although they speak with lips that are red with lipstick, although their uh, clothes are tightly bound around their bodies, they still wear the parda of the mind, right? Um, so 
when you are living in a foreign country, you're expected to conform, you're expected to completely, you know, uh, embrace the multiculturalism and hybridity of that country. So that is the challenge of heterodoxy, right? There is a larger implication of intersectionality if you are an immigrant coming from a certain traditional orthodox space, right, going into a heterodox world, right? So women have as many challenges of heterodoxy today as they had challenges of orthodoxy. And the worst part is that we straddle these two, right? Sometimes we we uh, we are supposed to, you know, uh, fit ourselves into orthodox molds, right? And, and certain other times we are made to feel free. But what are we actually fitting into? We are fitting into a heterodox world. So you will look, for example, you see the idea of um, women, right? And their bodies and what media is doing with it, right? So where do you draw the line between objectification of women and what we call as freedom of the body, right? So when women, um, you know, uh, are basically finding agency, right? by pushing the limits of you know the clothing on their bodies right or uh, by negotiating with the you know the limits of the skin and the body right it appears to be very emancipatory right but uh, there is a different you know apparatus at work there and that apparatus is media right um, so uh, where do you draw the line between objectification and you know uh, what what you would call as for example sexual agency Right. So uh, this is just an example of how we straddle or we are supposed to straddle these worlds of heterodoxy. Right. And uh, orthodoxy. Right. Um, and as we learn to straddle these things, you know, I mean, we, we 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 like to think that we are very good at doing these things. And one of the things we always say is women are very good managers. They manage home and work so well. They are born managers. They're good at managing. Right. So we say these things to ourselves, and, and that's how we don't really look at the reality of how the impossibility of straddling these worlds or how much we go through straddling these worlds. That is not discussed, right? So there is a glossing over. There is, a, you know, uh, what you would call as a false sense of, uh, you know, uh, empowerment that comes from a developmental model, that comes from the idea of empowerment as you know, money or as, uh, you know, certain positions that we hold or, you know, certain accolades that we have won, right? Even as we, you know, deal with these challenges, right? So, and I'm sure we uh, we have these dialogues as women, right? Uh, so when you look at women across the world, right, especially so women who have emigrated from, uh, you know, uh, traditional economies, traditional cultures to heterodox cultures, the uh, the burden of, being feminine is greater because the burden of being feminine is a heterodox burden. It's not just an orthodox burden. And you will see this in a lot of Southeast Asian feminist writing. Okay. Right. Uh, so let me just uh, change the slide. Just give me a minute, please. Yeah. Okay. So these are some of the uh, questions of uh, you know immediate relevance for southeast asian feminist writing right and how i mean what are the lenses that we take to these uh, you know women so questions of uh, you know uh, the critique of western fe feminism's definition and appropriation of third world women especially after 9 11 right aspects of identity home and belonging right among south asian uh, women in the diaspora so these are some of the uh, writers that I would like you to look at uh, to, uh, you know, I'm trying to give you examples now to kind of corroborate the argument that I have built up in favor of Southeast Asian feminism as uh, a feminism that looks at, 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 at the same time, divergent but intersectional approaches and how this divergence can be seen as a consciousness building experience in terms of dialogism. Right. So these are some of the writers, uh, you know, who have questioned religious fundamentalism, the veil and benevolent paternalism. Of course, we have heard of uh, Taslima Nazreen from Bangladesh, Intiaz Darkar, Mukhtar Mai, Tamima Darani, right? And um, Shalina Zara Jan Mohammed. These are, um, I mean, one hour is not enough for me to go through all of these writers. My attempt is to introduce you to some of the writers whom you could probably, 
you know, follow later or read up later. Now, when you look at especially one of the most ignored uh, spaces, right, especially when we look at South Asia, when we look at these larger, uh, you know, terms like South Asia, right, we tend to ignore, uh, you know, spaces like Singapore, Malaysia, right? Uh, <clears throat> we tend to ignore uh, spaces uh, like Sri Lanka, for example. So we really don't introduce these writers to our students or to our research scholars, not, not really, right? So, and it's very important for us, for example, to look at the question of ethnic minorities and how ethnic minority statuses of women become very integral to the kind of writing that comes from women in Malaysia. So two writers that I would like you to look at is one is Uma Mahindran, right? The Twice Born is the work. And Anita Sundar Raj, whose novel, The Banana Leaf Men, is very interesting. Uh, you know, because both... Both of these works is by English educated members of an ethnic minority. So on the one hand, you are an ethnic minority, but you are, you have, you know, because you belong to Malaysia and because you belong to a post-colonial space, you have, uh, you know, benefited from English education, right? So you can see the complexity of this identity, English educated, but an ethnic minority, right? And what are the questions of these women? These are questions of social integration and national unity, right? So what happens when uh, a nation tends to homogenize itself based on nationhood and nationalism? What happens to the ethnic minorities who may not want to belong to the larger scheme of nation and nationalism, right? Uh, so what are the challenges that ethnic minorities face, right, in a post-colonial context of Malaysia, right? So uh, the other writer I want you to look at is Monika Ali, especially her Brick Lane, uh, which looks at the women who are part of the Bangladeshi diaspora, right? Uh, so what does it mean to be Bangladeshi, diasporic, woman, living in a foreign country, uh, you know, at, while at the same time, you know, straddling your orthodox, you know, religion, as well as your heterodox multiculturalism? right, that you have to lend yourself to. So uh, women as mothers who need to probably integrate their uh, cultures and religions into the children while at the same time, right, uh, helping them to be multicultural in a diasporic space, right. So when we look at Sri Lanka, this becomes very interesting because um, I'm not going to look at a Tamil writer or, uh, you know, a Sinhalese writer from Sri Lanka. I'm going to look at uh, Arasan Aigam. Arasan Aigam is what, uh, what you could recognize as a burger, right? B-U-R-G-H-E-R. Um, and Arasan Aigam goes back to the colonial, I mean, her roots go back to the colonial times. So the first, one of the first Dutch men to set foot on uh, the Sri Lankan soil, as it was called then, right? Uh, you know, the Ceylonese soil was her great grandfather, right? Um, and burghers are of mixed ancestry, which means that, right, the Dutch came to Sri Lanka and they occupied it. And there were a lot of, you know, marriages, right, um, intercultural marriages, interracial marriages, right. Uh, so Arisan Aigam is a, is, a, is a Dutch burger, right, basically, right. Uh, she is um, partly Sinhalese, partly Dutch, and she is married to a Tamil. Right. And when you look at uh, Arsana Aigam's response to the civil war in Sri Lanka, right, um, you know, you have this movement for the Tamil Elam, right, which is so integral to the post colonial history of Sri Lanka. Right. When Arsana Aigam witnesses the conflict between the Sinhalese and the Tamils, right, the question within her is, right, who am I? Right. Am I Sri Lankan? And does it mean that I have to be either Tamil or Sinhalese to be Sri Lankan? What does it mean to have colonial blood in your wings and to look at the same kind of, uh, you know, ravaging history, rampaging history, dead bodies, corpses strewn across the street, right? Uh, so, you know, history continues to, uh, you know, narrate a story of violence and women continue to witness history as violence and they continue to stand and stare there dumbfounded as mute witnesses. Now, this brings to mind a very interesting, uh, you know, poem, Anna Ak uh, Akmatova's Requiem. I don't know if you have, you know, read this. But Anna Akmatova, you know, writes this during the Stalinist regime, right? 
when she is standing outside the Leningrad prison waiting for some news about her son, right? Um, and she invokes the crucifixion scene there. And she says, right, uh, when, when Christ was being crucified, there were two Marys. One was Mary Magdalene and one was Ma Mary, Mother Mary. And both of them, right, wept silently as Christ was being crucified, right? Everybody looked up to Christ, but nobody looked at the women, right? And that is a very important statement about the role of uh, women in history with a capital H. Women are reduced to either victims or witnesses, right? And a woman's narration of history will never find its way into a history book. Because histories are histories of empires that are built, empires that are expanded, or even the downfall of empires. But you will not talk about what women witnessed as history. And women will talk about the violence. Women will talk about the bloodied bodies. They will talk about the, uh, you know, uh, never-ending violence of nation nationalism, right? And, uh, you know, how do, they, how do they relate to this history? And why is it important for us to look at women's uh, witnessing of history? And how do poets become not just witnesses, but what you, what you could call as historians? And that is what women like Arasana Aigam do. That is what Akhmatova does during the Stalinist regime, right? Uh, so a lot of women's writing during times of violence becomes a very different kind of historiography, right, which breaks away from the historical mold of nation building, empire building, right, and empowers the act of witnessing itself as a historical experience, right? So Arisna Aigam questions the preemptive inclusion of nation as the basis of post-colonial history and the subsequent exclusion of subjects outside of the binary. So if you are not a Tamil or a Sinhalese, you are not even seen as a citizen of Sri Lanka at this point of time when it is this conflict which becomes the identity of Sri Lanka. And if you look at Arasana Aigam's Nallur, right, if you have, um, if you look at this beautiful poem called Genealogies, right, uh, you know, uh, we have our genealogies where she talks about her colonial roots, right, and the burden of her Dutch colonial roots that she has to bear while at the same time trying to be a Sri Lankan who is not who is not Sinhalese, who is not Tamil, who is not any of these things, but a woman of Sri Lanka, right? Uh, so for me, uh, Arisana Aigam is a very important Sri Lankan voice and a very important Southeast Asian voice, right? Because um, the histories of these women are not histories of a glorious nation. These are not the histories of a beautiful empire that is being built. These are not the histories of India, for example, being independent from the British, right? What is the violence of that, you know, establishment of the nation? What are the, what is the violence of the linguistic imposition of identity upon India? What is the, uh, you know, epistemic violence of, for example, cartography of the Indian map being drawn at the cost of the partition of India? And these are the important concerns that uh, I think to me, we have to look at in Southeast uh, Asian feminist writers. So when you're reading a Southeast Asian feminist writer, invariably you are looking at either caste or race or religion or nation or nationalism, or at the most you are looking at their own local ethnic experiences as women. And it's very important for us to do that, right? Yeah. So uh, these are two immigrant writers from Afghanistan, right? I know that Afghanistan is not part of Southeast Asia, right? But uh, it, it, it resonates. As I said, this is a dialogic process. It resonates pretty much uh, a lot of concerns of diasporic, uh, you know, uh, women from Islamic uh, context. I will not say Muslim nations. I will not use those terms, but I will use the term Islamic because Islamic is a global identity, right? So one is Lida Abdullah, um, and I'm looking at a very interesting text called Kuchis, which is a poem, right? So she says, standing in the mosque, then I did not know that a couple of years later, I would become a refugee. I had lost many things, small things, marking the boundaries of my small universe. But how does one lose a country? From where does it slip one's grip? And Zora Said, right, uh, this is an extract from what this car revealed. Okay, 1998, New York City, in an apartment overlooking a blue gray street, her mother's veil hangs on the wall like a talisman. Her lapis doves and tinseled mountains are misplaced and glorified 
behind plates of glass at museums. She visits them weekly and cleans the glass between them. So this is basically a museumized history that you are preserving in a faraway land. So you have a scrap of your mother's scarf hanging upon the wall like a talisman. You have a few objects there which remind you of Afghanistan, right? Or you might be standing in a mosque, right, in Afghanistan, not knowing that a couple of years later, right, you your country would have slipped from your grip. And you do not know where you belong to. You do not know what is home. And your idea of home is a constant um, quest for home in a homeless space, right? Um, I would also like to bring here a very interesting poet uh, whom I could not include in the slide because I was just, uh, I told you I had some technical issues, so I could not uh, put that in this morning. I'm extremely sorry. Uh, this is Miriam Y.Y. Low. And Miriam Y.Y. Low is uh, of Malaysian Canadian descent, right, on the one hand, and she is of Australian descent on the other hand. I think her father, right? So Miriam Y.Y. Low basically uh, goes back to Singapore with her children, I, you know, uh, she goes out on a holiday and she writes this very, very beautiful, um, you know, you know, poem on a bumboat cruise that she takes on the Singapore River, right? And she talks about, you know, uh, what it means to go back to Singapore where she grew up, what it means to go back to Singapore as a Canadian mother of two children, what does it mean for her to go back to Singapore, uh, you know, to a city which she does not recognize anymore? Right. Because you will see that everything has changed. Singapore has been taken over by tourism so completely that the, the, the common, uh, intimate, identifiable markers of her city have changed completely. Right. Uh, so Singapore becomes a city state, right, of hybrid multicultural capitalist values, a Singapore which she does not recognize. Right. And when she tries to talk to the local people, Right, they recognize her more as a foreigner than as a Singaporean. Right, so uh, this is very, very similar to a lot of uh, immigrant writers trying to go back to their spaces and trying to go back home. Right, and realizing that in the first place, home was not there at all because what was home once has changed utterly. Right, so uh, the the challenges of multiculturalism, the challenges of going back to one's roots or not being able to find one's roots post globalization is something that is very common among these writers right yeah so these are feminist voices i don't think i have time now ma'am can i wind up in another 2 minutes hello uh yes ma'am i think uh, you have uh, 6 more minutes oh really okay yes okay. Right. So these are two uh, nations which are very underrepresented when we look at uh, uh, South Asian or Southeast Asian uh, feminist uh, writers. We don't look at uh, Nepal and Bhutan. Right. And one of the reasons why this happens is why why don't we hear about Nepal or Bhutan? Um, you know, why do we you know, for example, why is it that Taslima Nazreen becomes the face, the feminist face of Bangladesh? Why do we not hear about other writers? It's because of the politics of translation, obviously, right? Um, because we live in a world where literatures that are not available in English translation, right, are not even seen on the global map. These voices are not even heard. So uh, it's a very sad thing that even as we work within these post-colonial spaces, even as we question the first world ideology of feminism as women living in uh, Southeast Asia, we also ironically have to depend on English translation for uh, a certain amount of visibility, for a certain amount of circulation of our texts, right? So some of the writers who have been translated or who have written in English from Nepal and Bhutan, you can look them up. One is Manjushri Tapa and the other is Sushma Joshi, right? And then you have Kanzang Chodin and Dorji Wangmo from Bhutan. Uh, all, of, all of them are extremely intersectional in their politics of you know, writing as women because, you know, they talk about their local experiences of belonging to a post-colonial, uh, you know, state apparatus of majoritarian politics, of having to negotiate their womanhood in terms of nationhood. And that becomes integral to these writers, right? Um, so it's important for us, 
right, to narrativize women's experiences from within larger context of cultural hegemony and power relations when we talk about Southeast Asian women. Uh, you know, how do we, uh, you know, this is actually my concluding slide. So how do we address the intersectionality of women's personal and social identities, right? And how do we look at, uh, you know, writing from Southeast Asia, right, women's writing from Southeast Asia as a dialogic, you know, uh, process of community consciousness, right? Because who are these women writing to? What are these women writing about, right? Uh, and if you are going to take a common lens to Southeast Asia or even South Asia, it's important for us to look at the convergences. It's important for us to compare the, you know, uh, the different sites of oppression and the forms of resistance that we bring to patriarchy, right? And this is very, very important in order to foster a dialogic community consciousness. Uh, in fact, we recently had a conference at Christ University. It was based on this idea of the of Asia Commons, right? So, like we have, have we had the idea of negritude that came out of the uh, you know uh, Harlem Renaissance, right? And negritude at the uh, beginning of the 20th century when there was a there was an attempt to build a, build a horizontal community consciousness across um, you know histories of black oppression, across histories of racism, whether it was from South Africa or Africa or the Caribbean or Afro-American experience of being, uh, you know, belonging to a history of slavery and transnational, I'm sorry, trans, um, uh, sorry, a transatlantic uh, slave trade, right? So these are very important, uh, you know, negotiations. And one of the terms that has come into currency recently and which has been discussed extensively is the idea of Asia Commons, right? Um, so if, you are, if we are going to look at, you know, people from Asia, Right, or if you are going to look at Asia as a community, right, uh, that is responding to a larger, you know, stereotyping from the West, then how do we, uh, you know, cut across our national barriers to be able to talk to women across Southeast Asia or across South Asia? And that is what we are talking about, right? And the literature is a very important site of resistance, which is also a site for community consciousness and sisterhood. And that is what Southeast Asian feminist literatures are about. They are about, you know, the idea of a dialogic community or a dialogic community consciousness, right? Where we are able to integrate the empirical basis of oppression with the imaginative, where we are able to challenge the colonial basis of history through writings based on historicity or historiography, right? Uh, where we see men's narratives as not uh, different from the national narrative or the nationalist discourse, but as a challenge or as an alternate uh, response uh, to the, you know, uh, hegemonic discourse of nationalism. And th this is very important when we, uh, you know, uh, when we look at, you know, these nations, we also need to look at the convergences, right? Not just look at them as, okay, this is Sri Lankan writing, or this is from, this is Bhutanese, or this is Malaysian, or this is Singaporean. Uh, it's important for us right uh to, to to look at the convergences right and that is where the strength of feminism lies right yeah so this was my last slide thank you thank you for uh, bearing with all the technical uh you know hazards of this presentation can i exit the screen and come uh, back to yes. the presentation yeah yes ma'am. Uh, the session is now open to the participants to ask questions so you can either unmute and ask the questions or you can put it in the chat box. Good morning. Good afternoon, ma'am. I have a doubt. Yeah. Yes. Uh, earlier in the presentation, you mentioned about the Western world feminism and the third world feminism. Yes. So what? Uh, how can we exactly fit the privilege of translation or the politics of translation when we took it for a deep study? How can we exactly use it? Okay, this is very, uh, like I said, this is a very uh, a diabolical situation, right? Because on the one hand, if you look at, uh, especially, uh, let, let's take the case of India, okay? Uh, there are so many regional Indian women writers, uh, you know, and their uh, feminist politics, either as narratives uh, or as write forms of writing or as forms of resistance, uh, you know, unfortunately, 
right? We are depend. I mean, they do not uh, find a register in the sense that translation becomes the only way in which texts are circulated, right? So if you are looking at literatures, uh, global literatures, if you're looking at the politics of international publishing, if you are looking at the politics of readership of women across the world, it is heavily dependent on translation, right? Uh, for example, a writer like Volga, who is writing from uh, you know Andhra Pradesh, for example, I don't know if it's Telangana now, but uh, she basically writes, uh, you know, I mean, uh, she is somebody who is revisiting the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, right? And because she is available in translation now, right, we have access to so many different uh, approaches to the Ramayana, for example. Uh, at the same time, it's important for us to realize that there are a lot of Northeastern, uh, you know, Indian women writers writing from Manipur, Meghalaya, Arunachal Pradesh, who are basically narrativizing their folk traditions, right? They who are narrativizing their folklore as writing. But then you will see that these are not available in, uh, you know, translation. So there is a double bind. We are heavily dependent upon translation to read Indian writing as Indian writing. And unfortunately, that is in English, right? And that's what I was talking about. So coming to the second part or the first part of your question, where you talked about first and third world, right? Uh, so you never really hear about the second world, right? And we don't even ask anybody, what is the second world? We are so, so fixated on the first world nation as the developed nations, right? Uh, and to a large extent, the politics of both publication and media, right, and journalism, all of these are controlled by the developing countries. Right? So most of our consumption of news, right, is news that is programmed and conditioned by first world nations. This is true of publications also. So if, you, if I want to publish something internationally, right, uh, I will have to contend with the ideologies of the West. So uh, 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 say a US, a publisher in US, will not publish something that I might write against capitalism or consumerism, right? Or if I question the big brother attitude of uh, US, that will not be published, right? Uh, so of course, we have a lot of uh, local publishers, right? But what is the language of publishing, right? How do, we, how do we read the texts that we read? We read them in English largely, isn't it, right? So uh, that is what I was talking about, right? Um, so the, I was trying to tell you how uh, the lens that we, the feminist lenses or the lens largely that we take to the third world women is a Western feminist lens. And in fact, our grounding in feminism is also largely Western, right? But you will realize that uh, without looking at the historical materialism of uh, the conditions of women, right, in Southeast Asian countries, it's impossible for us to talk about feminism. For example, in India, most of the feminist literature that is fem that we you know what is called as feminist literature is something that revolves around caste nation and nationalism right uh, and these are uh, these are not feminists just because they look at the relationships between men and women it's not as simple as that so the point i was trying to make on the one hand was we should not take this very reductive simplistic understanding of feminism to southeast asian texts on the one hand right because obviously Southeast Asian literatures uh, resist a certain uh, you know, hegemonic notions, right, from uh, an intersectional politics. But on the other hand, the, the politics of publication, the politics of translation, the politics of global consumption of what we call as uh, a literature is largely dependent on the politics of English translation. And that itself is hegemonic, is what I was trying to say, right? Have, have I answered your question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much, ma'am. Politics of translation was something that uh, came up during this week, I think, during our second session. So okay. thank you so much for elaborating on that. So uh, do we have any more questions? Should I check the chat box once and see if there are any questions there? Um, I'm checking the chat box, ma'am. There aren't any questions. But if you're able to do so, you can. Google, ma'am. If they put it there, we yes. will just read out the question yeah okay i think somebody unmuted and uh, asked a question yes i think is it devendra kumar no. uh, mr devendra kumar i think you can go ahead with your question uh, 
ma'am. Yes. What is feminist and feminism, ma'am? Sorry. What, what is, is difference between fem feminist and feminism, ma'am? Feminism, feminine, feminist, and feminism. Okay, okay, okay. okay. See, uh, feminine is more of an ideological uh, set of characteristics. It's an essentialist. Uh, what I mean by that is, when you say a woman is kind, sympathetic, loving, motherly, right? And a woman is supposed to be all of this. And this is what you define as feminine, largely, right? Uh, so. The term feminine refers to the ideological conditioning of women through certain qualities. Okay. Whereas the term feminist is a political identity which questions these ideological essentialist characteristics or qualities as feminine. So, for example, if you tell me that because I'm born with a womb, right, I have a I have a uterus in my body, I have to become a mother. That is a very essentialist way of saying you are a woman right so as a woman i can choose to be a mother or not choose to be a mother right not being a mother does not make me less feminine that is a feminist position so that is the difference between feminine and feminist um what was the third uh, term that you talked about feminine feminist and what was the third term Feminism. Feminism. Okay. So feminism is uh, it's an it's a, it's a yes, uh, what you could call as a discourse. It is a set yes, of ideologies yes, which questions dominant patriarchal ideologies. So feminism is the ideology. I mean, sorry, feminism is the discourse. Okay. Uh, and the discourse is a set of ideologies. Okay. Thank you. Of feminist, uh, you know, response to the idea of okay, the feminine. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. You're welcome. I think Sai Harshita has a question here. With the widening horizon of gender studies and queer communities, isn't there an ambiguity that seeps into the identity of women writers? Uh, Sai Harshita, I don't think I would call it an ambiguity. I would call it a heterogeneity, right? Um, of course, I have not touched upon queer writers here mainly because you don't really have a lot of, uh, especially from Malaysia, Singapore, Bhutan, Nepal, uh, Sri Lanka, you don't have a lot of representative queer writers. That's because these uh, nations do not have, I mean, women in these nations don't have that much of agency to talk about it, right? Of course, we have Indian uh, queer writers, but I didn't want to talk about it because uh, my approach was very different. It was uh, more in terms of uh, intersectionality, right? But but uh, if you have queer writers, uh, women queer writers, they are they are mostly uh, you know writing from a space which is more intersectional because another dimension gets add, added to this right already intersectional identity which is uh, one sexuality right. I think Doctor Abzal Fatima says, um, oh okay sorry that is for the organizer that is that is for us ma'am so okay. Uh, I think there are a lot of requests for uh, the slides. Yes, yes. I will share it with uh, the Dr. Yashoda. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Do you. we have any other questions? Ma'am, I have a question. Yes. Uh, while you explain a doubt, you mentioned that we are seeing the third world feminism through the eyes of Western world feminism. I is it that we are... Uh, just like that, we are seeing it as a normal thing or it is being forced to us. What is okay? Okay, there are two responses to this. See, uh, you look at your introduction to feminism courses in uh, universities across India, just an example. Uh, how are most of us introduced to feminism? We are introduced to feminism to a Western model of progressive, uh, radical, emancipatory feminism. Right, based on equity, right? Uh, I mean, for example, we are not introduced to feminism through our own cultural politics. You come to that later. What I mean by that is when you study postcolonial literatures in a class, that is when you are introduced to the intersectionality of women's feminism in India, for example, right? Uh, so, but, but we should change that model. 
right? Feminism begins from the grassroots. Feminism begins from where you are. Feminism begins from the local, right? So uh, to a large extent, you know, feminism is even to this day seen as a fight for equality with men. And I'm not saying it is not. All that I'm saying is for a woman, uh, you know, from a lower class or from a lower caste, the politics of patriarchy is not just about getting a job and, uh, you know, going to work and earning a good salary, right? That is a very Western progressive model. And that is why I said first world, right? So the first world feminist model is largely a model based on radical progressive uh, feminism, which leads to a certain kind of emancipation. But it, that is not what we are looking at. Right. If you are if you as a woman, if you are asking questions of religion and caste, those are very feminist questions because you're asking them as a woman. Right. So uh, in answer to your question, first answer is the West has continued to look at the third world as one homogeneous entity. So if you look at, uh, for example, in Afghanistan, right, uh, the, the when peace was established and the, this is during the first uh, you know, after 2001 and all that. So there is a benevolent paternalism, right? So people, women from media, women journalists, women writers, they came to Afghanistan and they conducted these workshops, right, uh, for women to talk about themselves. And the idea that all the women in Afghanistan are oppressed in the same way, for example, under the Padda, I mean, under the Burqa or under the Taliban in certain ways, right? And that we are here to emancipate them, right? So there is a benevolent paternalism towards the third world, right? That informs how first world looks at the third world women, number one. Number two, we ourselves are so much conditioned into feminism through a first world lens that we tend to look at questions of caste, questions of religion, questions of ethnicity, right? Indigeneity. These are all questions that we see as post-colonial questions. We don't see them as questions of gender. Right. So I, what I'm saying is these disciplinary boundaries that we have saying this is Indian literature, this is post-colonial literature, this is feminist literature. Right. They all need to converge and you need to have a dialogue right, between different uh, you know, sites of oppression, experiences of oppression, right, regions. So if you're always looking at literature through national boundaries, you will not be able to have this dialogue. OK, I hope I have clarified. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, and one more request. Can you yes. suggest a book to you know change the view in uh, that views according to the first world feminism? Can you suggest any uh, books? Okay, uh, Chandra Talpade Mohanty to begin with under Western lens. Uh, I can share that with Dr. Yashoda if you want to, um, or it's available freely. Um, okay, I'll do one thing. I will put my number in the chat box here. You can text me. Whoever wants to talk to me or text me, is that okay, Dr. Yashoda? Can I share my number with the audience? Uh, yes, ma'am. Or, or your mail ID, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay, okay. See, my laptop is acting up again. Or you can um, maybe even send a message to us, ma'am. We will share it in our WhatsApp group. Yeah, please. Uh, please do that because uh, <laughs> I have this uh, project screen window popping up on my screen. I can't uh, type anything. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, so participants, we will uh, share ma'am's mail ID in our WhatsApp group. So I hope you're all part of that group. So we'll just share it there. Thank you so much, ma'am. Oh. Ma'am, there's another question uh, yeah. from uh, Krishna Veni. Yes. Uh, so I'm just, I'll just read out the question. Since many people have that quest regarding the regional literature, what do you think is necessary to evade the disciplinary boundaries? Okay, okay. Um, the first important thing is uh, take a cultural studies approach that helps because cultural studies is a very transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, if you don't like the word transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach, right? Uh, see, for example, if I'm doing a cultural studies reading of a piece of literature or cinema or say space or context, whatever that text might be, Number one, cultural studies allows you to look at all kinds of texts. You can look at a song, you can look at a performance, right? You can look at literature, you can look at film, you can look at space, architecture, you can look at the commodities, materiality, all of this comes under cultural studies. 
So even if you are a literature student, it would be very nice if you could do a discourse analysis instead of doing just a textual analysis. If you're a research scholar, that is, or if you're a researcher, student, teacher, researcher, uh, discourse analysis is very important, right? Uh, where you're not just looking at the text and the meaning of the text, but rather you're looking at the materiality of the text. You're looking at how the text is produced and consumed, okay? Um, so this will help you to go beyond these disciplinary boundaries, right? Uh, and redefine your methodology. Uh, see, I mean, you, we don't all have to go back to uh, Irigere or uh, Bovar or, I mean, you have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, scholars in India. You have a lot of local scholars. Uh, even if you don't want to look at scholarly feminist uh, writers, you can, you know, come up with a methodology which is transdisciplinary. You can do an ethnographic study. You can interview women. Uh, you can actually, uh, you know, in some context, you may want to do field work with the women whom you're observing, right? Uh, so instead of just looking at a piece of literature as a, you know, story, for example, is it possible for you to look at it as a context of social realities, right? Is it possible for you to bring in ethnography into literary research? Is it possible for you to look at uh, historiography, right? And look at the whole idea of historical materialism? instead of just looking at the thematics and the character reading of the text. These are certain approaches. So uh, approaches to feminist research, feminist reading. Uh, and also, it's possible for departments of English to have uh, you know, transdisciplinary conferences. Um, you could have, uh, for example, I went to this uh, very interesting conference in Gandhi Gram in 2017. I can never forget that. It was uh, a conference that looked at uh, trans women, okay? And uh, there were three, uh, uh, you know, writers who had written autobiographies. They were trans women who were resource people, right? So for a change, we did not have scholars. We had actual people with who were talking about their experiences, right? So is it possible for us to uh, make our English studies departments English studies, conferences, reports, publications, research, less disciplinary, and take a wider lens to the concerns of women. I think that is that would be my response. I don't know if that was your question, right? Yeah. Ms. Krishnavini, have you uh, have I answered your question? Yes, ma'am. And thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, so thank you so much for such a brilliant session, ma'am. I think that's a consensus because the responses that we have received say that your session was excellent, highly informative, thought pro thought provoking, very fruitful, critical examination. So uh, we are all just wondering how interesting, informative, and uh, informative your classrooms would be. So we are all envious of your students who get to listen to you on a daily basis. So uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, pointing out the limitations of Western white feminism and uh, situating that feminism in the context or the space of uh, Southeast uh, Asia and emphasizing the importance of ontological feminism. Uh, so I think Gopal Guru keeps saying it uh, in his EPW articles of yeah. how space is embedded in uh, experience and how it is significant for thought and uh, theory thought theory formation or articulation. So thank you so much. I think it was thought provoking and uh, it would be it would have been food for thought for many of the research scholars out there. So uh, thank you so much for such a brilliant session. Ma thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, you know, and uh, thank you for your warmth. And, uh, you know, I mean, I always like a lot of questions. Thank you for all your questions. Um, special thanks to Dr. Yashoda for uh, coordinating, collaborating with me all these uh, days, I think more than a month now. And congratulations on uh, conducting such a nice seminar and uh, webinar, I should say. Uh, and I mean, uh, I would be very happy to talk to all of you anytime you want me to. Okay, thank you. Should I log out from the session now or? Yeah. Yeah, we just have the vote of thanks now. So if you choose to log out, it's fine, ma'am. No, no, no. I'll, I'll stay for the vote of thanks. No Thank problem. you, ma'am. A very warm afternoon to all. When it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or take them with gratitude, comments G.K. Chesterton. As the curtains come down on the five-day national webinar series 
on post-colonial literatures, contexts, and concerns, I deem it my honor to extend the vote of thanks. At this juncture, I remember with gratitude and invoke the blessings of our revered founder, Shridhar Etraj, a legendary lawyer, to whose vision and munificence this institution, Etraj College for Women, with its current strength of over 8,000 students, owes its existence. Etraj College for Women, founded in the year 1948, is dedicated to the holistic education and development of women students and has made a great mark in the field of women's education. I'd like to express my deep sense of gratitude to the esteemed guest speakers of this webinar series on post-colonial literatures, contexts, and concerns. On the first day, we had with us Dr. Rajuman Ara, Assistant Professor, Department of English Language Education, English and Foreign Languages University, Shillong Campus, Meghalaya, who introduced us to some of the post-colonial elements found deep-rooted in English poetry from Northeast India. Dr. Annie Kuryachin, Associate Professor and Head, Department of English, Women's Christian College, was the speaker for the second day, who brought the topic of discussion closer home with her speech centered on contemporary Tamil literature in translation from a neo-post-colonial perspective. Dr. Rani, Associate Professor and Head, Department of Languages and Literature, Sri Satyasai Institute of Higher Learning, Anantapur, Andhra Pradesh, reiterated the need for counter storytelling in post-colonial discourse with illustrations drawn from recent writings and was a speaker on day three. On day four, we had with us Professor, Professor Kusha Tibari from the Department of English, Shyamlal College, University of Delhi, who reflected on the recent research areas that are the need of the art on the topic post-colonialism and gender studies in India. And today, we were the beneficiaries of the excellent session on interlocking schemes of resistance and sisterhood, intersectional approaches to Southeast Asian feminist literatures by Dr. Shushma Murthy, Associate Professor, Department of English, Christ deemed to be university, who gave a panoramic view of the Southeast Asian literatures. I express my heartfelt thanks to our chairperson, Mrs. Chandra Devi Tanigachanam, members of the college management, principal Dr. S. Prode, vice principals Dr. D.B. Usharani and Dr. T. Ushapriya for their unstinting support and guidance in all our endeavors. A special thanks is due to Ms. Eshtoda, head of the Department of English, self-supporting, whose dedication and commitment has made this national webinar series a successful event. My thanks are due also to the advisory committee of the webinar, headed by Dr. Manger Karasi, associate professor and head, Department of English aided, and all the others for their support and guidance. I wish to place on record my sincere thanks to the staff and students of the Department of English, whose support has eased our way into making this event a successful one. A special thanks to all the technical support rendered by the friends and well-wishers of the department, whose timely help and support on the technical side of the webinar series has made our work much easier. And last but not the least, my sincere thanks to all our participants who turned out in such large numbers on all the five days of the session. Their keen enthusiasm and active participation throughout the webinar series was enduring, and I personally thank each one of you for being such an exuberant audience and making it a delightful experience for us. Thank you all once again and hope to meet you all in the next event. Best wishes. We would now like Okay, uh, participants who attended all the si five sessions and have submitted the feedback form will receive your e-certificates by mail in uh, 10 days time. So please stay in the uh, WhatsApp group till then. Now we'll have the rendition of the college song and the national anthem. Please rise for the same.
Thank you, ma'am. Do we uh, do we have the permission to exit now? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay, Sushma here. Thank you. I'm leaving. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank you so much, Bye. Take care. All the best. Bye, bye, ma'am.